Hello everyone, today we talk about Roman marines of the early empire. So after the Battle of Actium, some 800 warships were in active service. And when Octavian took power, he maintained naval strength and undertook a serious program of reorganization. The Roman navy was thus distributed in three permanent Praetorian fleets of high seas, as they were conceived, stationed at Forum Iuli, today's Frajus in southern France, uh, in Ravenna on the Adriatic coast of northeastern Italy, and at Misenum near Naples in the southwest to protect the Tyrrhenian Sea. While the bulk of the Antonian fleet was captured at Actium and initially based at Frejus, both the base and the fleet were, however, soon disbanded as unnecessary. Right? The other two fleets were maintained instead, and their main duties during the early Roman Empire was substantially one of policing um, and convoy escorting. And until the beginning of the 5th century, the Classis Praetoria Misenatis, so the Misenum fleet, uh, also bearing the title of Pia Vindex under Caracalla, was the main Roman imperial naval force, eventually losing importance to the Classis Ravennatis, so the fleet at Ravenna. And each of these fleets counted something like 10,000 men. The Ravenna fleet was considerably enlarged, especially under Vespasian. Provincial fleets existed as well. They defended the frontiers and supported the legions in the different provinces, um, being drawn also from you know different peoples that were under Rome or properly instituted by the Romans as as an imperial fleet uh, along the, the boundaries. For example, uh, the first and strategically most important of these fleets was the one of the Rhine in Germania. The military ports of which were linked by road to those of Gaul. By the time of the Drusian expedition in 12 BC, we know of the military port of Bonna, that is today's modern Bonn in, in Germany, and this was perhaps the main base of the Rhine fleet. It was directly linked with Gessoriacum, that is instead today's uh, Boulogne in France, and under the early empire, the Rhine fleet was uh, an integral part properly of the Roman army of Germania Inferior, right? That at the time was composed of four legions by, um, you know, by the first century AD, which means that the soldiers of such legions could be used in the fleet as marines, as militas classiari, so properly the uh, soldiers of the fleet uh, in Latin, which was the standard uh, name for the, the Roman marines proper, as we'll see now. Um, and so, with all the consequences that this, this implies, that fundamentally we're talking about the same, the same legionnaires were employed at, on, on, uh, also at sea, because naturally this Rhine fleet also in the North Sea, as we'll see, they, they, they were connected in fact also with Gaul, so there was this broader deployability of such troops during this time. And at the time of Civilis revolt, right, the, the Batavian revolt, we find in the army of Germania Inferior the legions 5th and 15th at station of Vetera, the 16th and the 1st at Novaesium, Nois, today's Nois, and in Bonna, right, previously we also know of the 11th legion. Um, so all these legions actually served with the Rhine fleet. And among the additional legions that were sent eventually to crush the, the Batamian revolt, we find also the first and second Adriutrix legions that were actually formed from fighting sailors, as we will see uh, in a while. Now, there were other fleets around the empires we've seen. Um, the Classis Alexandrina, stationed in Alexandria, was one. The Syriaca from Syria. The Moisica patrolling the Danube, the Pannonica on the Danube too, and the Britannica, that improved at the time, especially of Agricola's invasion of Scotland, where, as you know, the fleet basically followed the, the Roman expedition all, all along the, uh, 
the, the coast, in fact, coastal Scotland. And a small fleet also patrolled the Euphrates River on the eastern frontier. There was then the Classis Pontica on the Black Sea, which uh, counted 40 ships based at Trapezunte, today's tra- Trapezus in, in Turkey, uh, which was actually the main naval force for the defense of Asia Minor. And uh, it was mostly employed to keep under control the troublesome subsidians and to defend also the northeastern borders of the empire, patrolling the Black Sea coast as far as the allied Bosphoran kingdom of Panticapaea, that is today's modern Crimea, and that the Romans will eventually absorb as well, which had its naval traditions. As you know, the, the place was actually colonized by the Greeks previously, and so on. So we know from from Caesar, actually, that uh, in, in the late consular period, the Roman warships were entrusted to tribunes and centurions, properly, um, that were in turn put under the commanders, broader commanders, or called also Navarca. The crew of these warships was usually composed of uh, the milites classiari, as we've seen so properly, the marines, um, armed sailors, the nautai, that were technically the seamen responsible for the technical duties and also of ship handling, right, but were not excluded from the fighting. As we will see properly, everybody on board was, was actually a, a Roman soldier, and the oarsmen, the remiges, in Latin, from the historiography, we have mostly these the Hellenic terms um, the, that, that are, are employed to, to describe interchangeably with the Latin ones, but what the, the Roman uh, authors meant, uh, these categories of soldiers and satyrs. Right? We have in Greek, for example, the term of um, the heavily armored uh, oplitai, nautai, and eretai. Right? So these properly were, you know, the milites classiari were the Oplitae, right? Um, the uh, the Nautae, it's basically the same in classical uh, Latin pronunciation and in Hellenic, in ancient Greek. And Erethae were the oarsmen instead. Um, and sometimes, as we've seen, the embarked troops actually came from land based legions, right? As it happened, for example, the Battle of Actium, right? That was also a land battle, not just a naval one, by the way some anecdotes coming later about this and in fact the, also the problem that for a legionnaire originally was to even think to fight on on ships was originally not a very positive thing but at, by this time especially uh, late republic it had become you know a fairly and especially in this context a fairly uh, civil wars are all across the Mediterranean on these long distances a bit of a habit so um, and under Augustus and Tiberius, the crews and commanders of ships all belonged to the Familia Imperatoris. That is to say, they were all appointed, basically, from appointees from the, from the imperial family, um, as it was normal, actually, for it would remain normal also afterwards, but properly it, uh, a further you know, um, chain of command hadn't been uh, or still institutionalized. In fact, the, the military organization of this command, this command seems to have been embryonic in many ways. It was only under Claudius that instead naval forces began to, to have a, this more regular regime in general. This, this is important to stress also because, of course, Augustus gave a, an important sanction to, uh, to the uh, military administration. He, uh, properly, he, he enacted quite important reforms to stabilize the army forces, but still... A lot of aspects were still to be settled later. The most senior figures in the naval hierarchy during the early empire were the commanders of the two Italian fleets we've seen before, so Ravenna and Misena, that were praefecti of equestrian rank directly responsible to the emperor, and this speaks for the importance of the same fleets at that time. Consider in this regard that the Romans now have stabilized the Mediterranean, civil wars are over, but as you know, you know, just up to a certain point, uh, they will come uh, again, and the control 
of the sea was of dramatic importance at this time after Pom Pompey had slaughtered the Cilician pirates there wasn't much of a pirate activity out there but theoretically this could always pop out so actually this presence is somewhat overlooked in the general uh, balance of, of of the Roman Empire which was essentially a Mediterranean Empire by sheer you know uh, concentration of, of resources across the coastal centers um, and therefore we don't have to to underestimate it the immediate subordinates of the prefects were the sub prefect right, so sub prefects that were sometimes instead of equestrian rank um, with some previous military experience but not necessarily naval especially in this higher level subjectively was not even properly required right the, the, the machine in itself was already working right largely on, on its own um, these people were mostly you know the decision of you know that they had to take the main decision how where to employ how to move maybe they they weren't they hadn't been sailors in that regard the prefect of the provincial fleets uh, existed too of course and had a lower rank than those of the Italian fleets there were also detached commands, vexillaciones, con uh, comprising part of a fleet, right, so that did, it was split in a way, and commanded by praeposity, who were directly um, appointed by the fleet prefect, that had this the decision power. According to Vegetius, that naturally is a late Roman source, but speaks of this uh, previous times, the uh, Ravenna and Misenum fleets each had one legion attached, right? Um, numerically speaking, consider also a legion at that time counted something 50, 50 500 men. So if each of them had 10,000 men, we're talking about as many, you know, marines, potentially. As we've seen, they, these troops didn't have just a, a maritime employ, but technically speaking, was like half roughly of the people uh, you know employed as potentially a marine force and the rest as we've seen sailors and uh, oars and so on and Vegetius may actually also refer instead to um, the division of 10,000 marines into cohorts of, for their service on land right especially in Rome actually we will see where they had permanent barracks and special duties as the you know the Praetorians in each of these cohorts, you know that it was um, illegal to, to have a legion properly in, within the, the boundaries of Italy. So, as for the Praetorian cohorts, possibly the same marines didn't uh, reach the, the tenth number of of of, uh, of legion that made it, you know, of cohorts that made the administrative unit of the legion. Right, so it were just nine. We, we don't know, actually. Uh, these cohorts were probably arranged in, in slightly different ways. It was seen, as, we'll see it better later, that there wasn't much of a difference between marines and legionnaires, if not by equipment, especially, you know, uh, aside from the, the emergential situations in which literally, you know, land legions were taken and uh, embarked for some reason, but probably that the, there was also another chain of command. It's not entirely clear. We know that each marine cohort had, uh, was commanded by a so-called fleet centurion, and this rank is found uh, uh, ins inscribed in mm, several places, in including Rome chiefly, actually, but also Civita Vecchia and Portus, that is Ostia. And uh, so we're talking about Italy. We we find also some of it in Athens, Greece. There are numerous inscriptions mention, mentioning so-called centuriones classiari, right? So the marine centurions, or uh, classici, simply, so belonging to the fleet of the uh, of the Misenum fleet specifically. That are found also in here in localities that are technically far from the fleet's base, um, where they commanded vexillationes that had been detached there. The leader of the marines assigned to a land campaign instead was called the Praepositus Vexillationis, right, as we get from uh, an inscription from Rome. From at least the time of Nero, the sources distinguish between three different ranks in the Roman fleet. We have the Navarcus, 
the Triarchus, which may be the latter spe specifically commander of a tri trireme, we, we don't know, and the Centurio Classiarius or Classicus. So in inscriptions that are immediately lay after the, the, the reign of Nero, we find the term Centuria, so the century, that came to be as synonymous, associated at least with, with, with a warship, right? And we know from descriptions of Sulgius Caecilianus that in the 3rd century the rank of Centurio Navarcus was inferior to that of the legionary centurion. Right? So they were actually um, a minor figure, possibly even commanding less troops than the actual century that at this point calculated was about 80 men, but that fluctuated as as well. You know that initially it was 100 and Bolivian times 60, that this time is really 80. Um, so it seems that, and, and naturally all the various uh, ships, you know, were of different size and were kind of more or less than 80 marines. So there were evidently different levels of um, of command within even the same ship in, in a different da in, in a way that differed some way from from land uh, you know land troops organization terrestrial troops organization so it seems in fact that all three ranks were grades of centurions in this case but how they were graduated their relationship to one another uh, within the fleet or single crew is really unknown from an inscription in Baia, we get that the Emperor Antoninus conferred the rank of Centurio on the Trierarchi and Navarchi of the Misenum fleet, and that Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus extended it to the Principes classes, right, which were, I presume, NCOs. So, from from entering times, therefore, we, we know that there were at least three centurions' ranks on a single ship, the Trierarchus, the Navarcus, and the Princeps. And they seem to have been, however, more important than NCOs, because naval forces and warships were entrusted to the Centuriones that were designated sometimes as Navarchi of Ordo Tertius, that were basically commanders of large fleets, in that case the same ranks as the Praeposity and Praefecti of Provincial Fleets. So, very important posts in this case was the, was the high. The third one was the highest. Then the Ordo Secundus, small fleets or squadrons, and the Ordo Primus or Trierarchi, are the commanders uh, as commanders of triremes or Liburnae ships. Lower ranks were held instead by the Centuriones Classici, who commanded a unit of 100 nautai. Right, so here it's properly about the, the sailors rather than, than the marines specifically. And from the second century AD, um, they corresponded in rank were their counterparts on land. So this the homogenization comes at that point. We know also of junior, uh, let's say, NCOs in this sense, on the ships were the optio, the suboptio, the, the armor, standard bearers, you know, the trumpet gears, just as in the legion. We know of particular duties being performed by the beneficiarius stolarchi, with, or stolarchus simply, with the rank corresponded to that of the beneficiarius in the land forces. The secutor trierarchi, the pitulus, may have been a pitcher, the coimentarius, who was the colker instead, and the subcontor and coronarius, that instead have more uh, mysterious duties, but they were, that were probably also related to the ship maintenance. We understand here important also engineering capabilities. There were other juniors uh, such as the principales or immunes who performed the different tasks um, related also to the equipment and the running of the ship proper. Uh, these were the helmsmen uh, known as gubernator, his uh, deputy or proreta di naufilax, the man who gave the timing to the oarsmen as well, and a musician that gave the rhythm for oar movements that was very important. The lower ranks were the fleet soldiers slash marines, as we have seen, 
di, di militas classiari, di sailors, di nautai and di horsemen, di remiges. So, the Latin jurist Ulpian says, quote, that in the fleet all the sailors and rowers are soldiers. Right? So, we actually know that the fighting um, crew of a warship consisted not only of the militas classiari, of the marines proper, but um, including by that had also some specialists um, in, within the marines, um, such as, for example, the propugnatores, uh, the, the the were fundamentally an, uh, an elite assault infantry, the balistari, so the catapult crews, and the sagittari, the archers. So there was also a technical and tactical specialization, but also all the oarsmen and the seamen. In fact, what we often forget this time, in like you know, the scene, you know, dramatic Hollywood, uh, and as it went on for actually most of uh, all the ancient and, and the, the, the Middle Ages and also great part of the modern age, most of the horsemen were actually free men, right? Not all of them, uh, but the idea that were, these were just slaves being whipped and, uh, you know, abused is nonsensical because the horsemen had to be perfectly fit, well fed, uh, they had the necessary time to rest. At some point, we will have to make a hefty video explaining a bit what what naval, you know, what navigation was proper this time. Aside from naval warfare, we'll partly address today, and they were considered part of the probably of the possible f fighting crew proper, and treated as such. Um, we find um, information that there were other figures on on, on ships as as in the legions here, two doctors, for example, that were employed on each ship, right? The attendant to the sacrifices, never forget it was just a religious world and nothing else. Um, attendants to the orders, scribes, clerks, right? The ship, certain ships being really big banks needing a lot of administration to run. We also find mention, and probably on board, so we find also mentions in sources of various other specialists, we know uh, that they were under the command of an optio in the direction of an architectus, right? The shipwright of the fleet proper. And were also divided into fabri navales, that were the carpenters, the uh, artifices, the workers, um, yeah, properly made, um, and the velari, famous velari, sail makers or sail handlers. So these specializations naturally referred a little to the technical demands of ship handling, uh, but there was more, um, and that still connected to it, uh, such as the employment of expert classiari of the Misenum fleet, famously employed to operate the velarium, so this canopy that protected the spectators in, in the Colosseum from sun and rain, Right, people staying an entire day there, so and they needed this. Um, you know that the Velarium was rigged in sections. There are beautiful also animations. I'm sure if you search on YouTube. Well, this was performed by the sailors, called especially for, for this. Must it was a spectacle within within the the broader games in itself. There were also. Uh, a certain number of naval functionaries dealing with bureaucratic duties, as you imagine. Uh, some of, of them were, for example, the exceptor, the exactus, the scriba, the libraris, the rationalis. Um, they were all employed in service with the fleet proper, so not just also on land. And by contrast, the dispensator classes, that is the fleet paymaster and the tabularius, it was the five clerk were imperial freedmen or slaves that in this sense were not employed on active service right so it was a, a properly a free uh, militarized personnel that was involved constantly in the service the freedmen remaining on land as far as we, we understand um, not always we'll see that also some oarsmen actually at some point were freedmen but not always um, so a man's place in the cursus honorum, so in the you know in the rank career, depended not only upon his personal capabilities and military experience, especially at the the highest, as it's 
always the, the, the case, as we've seen also with the officers, but also in the favor of the emperor. For example, we know of the centurion Aquilius, that was just essentially more than, than an assassin hired by Septimius Severus, was appointed f um, uh, from um, the ranks to command, uh, of command of the frumentari, or the, the, the spies, the secret uh, services in part, to um, Primus Pilus of the 11th Legion Claudia, to eventually command uh, the command of Avexillatio, and through sp other, you know, further institutional honors, properly appointed as Praefectus Classis Praetori Ravennatis. Hell of a career, that that hadn't definitely come from 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 the bottom of the the naval one, the naval ranks. So in the mm, early years, uh, in this context today, we talk also a bit of, about the late Republic. Let's say a Roman soldier, a Roman legionnaire, the Milas, was um, was was sent on warships usually as a measure of punishment, in some way. Soldiers in general didn't very much like to fight at sea. Now we can't, we don't know much about the, the mindset of the time, but we're also, mm, you know, properly not just different strains, but we're also con conception that the the Romans were weren't much of a sea people, as you know. Uh, they would become forcefully, but surely by the, this later times, these early imperial times, now the, the Romans had adapted to everything and developed, and say topped everything in that regard, while transforming the f fighting sailors in terrestrial troops was seen, was regarded as a promotion. And this was, th these measures were not properly part of a normal military duty. We can't think that during the civil wars a lot of things in this sense went on for sheer necessity, as we were saying before. Um, however, and, and that's what made it frequent at some point to Nautai and Militas Classiari to be engaged in land battles at some point, um, as well as for land troops to be em embarked on ships. For example, of one of the 30 legions raised by Antonius, the, the 17th was known as Classica because of its service at sea. Right In the early period, uh, also the oarsmen and sailors were uh, usually recruited from among allied peoples, right, or close, uh, at least among the, the lowest class of the citizens, um, you, you know, the, the, the Capite, Kansas, and the, 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 the Liberty as well, freedmen, uh, leave states that uh, they uh, they form basically attachments of men in the classes scripte. Um, and um, contrary to popular belief. Levy, by the way, didn't properly even um, differentiate the... Uh, there are certain examples in which he he writes, he he means classes as as a navy, uh, looking at the older classes of recruitment, because if you know that in Latin at the time, you know, classes had come to define the, properly the, the navy. Well, originally it was the, the, the class of recruitment, you know. We know that also we have, that we have to be careful about reading these sources sometimes. Um, as we were saying before, however, service as rowers or, or warships was generally fulfilled by freedmen, right, and only in exceptional circumstances by slaves, right. So the freedman is technically a freeman, but he's bound, as you know, to to his um, freer. Um, there, the, the, there are certain things he cannot do, but still, you know, there are people who are substantially doing a living on their own. So that's the point, and they're well treated after all. According to Dio Cassius, during the civil wars, slaves were enrolled in the fleet. Right? The I don't know how many millions of people were mobilized during the uh, the, the the civil wars of the the late Republic. Um, so manpower was critical in many ways, and you know, as if you're just searching for orders, um, where, you know, you can't trade them as for for that function and more easily as for as legionnaires. So. That is where you want to fill the ranks, and also not employing other freedmen or people that can be enlisted according uh, as legionnaires, as Roman citizens. According to Appian and Suetonius, um, they were armed. Um, be, um, you know, before armed, they were made freemen in some case, uh, so that um, they would become properly liberty in turn if they were to 
to be properly marines in this regard as well. So in the late consular period, Rome still, because because there was shortage, even of, especially of that fighting force, there was, and in the late consular period, Rome still relied heavily, however, on those properly non-Roman peoples, the Peregrini, um, who had a strong maritime tradition. This was normal. Rome, as you know, in this time with the Augustan reforms, has basically institutionalized many auxiliary troops coming from everywhere in the empire that have that, that their own specialties, their own, their usually of um, of origin, in their uh, especially people from 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 the eastern Mediterranean were versed in, you know, they had quite advanced nautical. Um, uh, Technologies and traditions since since millennia. Think about Lebanon. Think of, you know. In fact, most of them, as we will see, also came from from Syria. Um, and in uh, Cicero, in his Philippica, urged the Senate that the proconsul Cassius should be appointed to the administrator of Syria in the war uh, against Dolabella, we will see in some occasion, with the power to recruit, in fact, sailors in Asia, Bithynia, Pontus, and Syria. Right, so these are all eastern provinces. Um, and uh, one reason also given for the defeat of Antony at Actium was that his crews were made up of all sorts of races, quote, uh, they were not reliable because also, quote, they had, as they had been wintering at a distance from from Antony, they had uh, had no practice, and their numbers had been diminished by disease and desertions. That probably even more than previous uh, skills in naval affairs w were, was a was a plague, generally speaking, in that context. The also fleets of vassal kings naturally were often used to to prevent piracy in the broader clientary system of Rome and the frontiers. Before we spoke of Crimea and uh, the king of of uh, Bosphorus uh, of the say of the Bosphoran kingdom, Sauromatus, right at the time of Augustus, operated with his own fleet against the Tauri, right, and other pirates in the Black Sea. Right. So you already find peoples who have their own fleets. You use them just uh, you let them use their own armies, etc. And at the end of the Republic, the recruitment amongst the Allies was uh, soon the only source for the Classiari and Nautai, because the formerly employed slaves, Libertin Proletari, who had been potential recruiters, as we've seen, now had you know, numerous employment opportunities during the reconstruction of the Roman state after the chaos of the civil wars. Right? Um, and as we've seen, these troops had been institutionalized as such, at least the, especially the Peregrini in the auxiliary units as well. The Roman proletari would simply, you know, as free, you know, as Roman citizens would, you know, probably find, in fact, a better job, and also the Liberti, would sometimes even fared better than these, than the average. And um, for a while, the the Marines did the. the Classiari, to say better, broadly meant, um, consequently did not enjoy the same level of prestige as the land forces, because they were considered to be all foreigners, or almost at least. There is um, a veteran of Antony's army before the Battle of Actium who was, was, was meant to have said this, quote, an infantry centurion, a man who had fought um, and actually, it's a it's an anecdote. It's a third person, then there is the direct speech. It says an infantry centurion, a man who had fought many a battle for Antony and was covered with scars, burst into laments as Antony was passing by and said, "General, why dost thou distrust these wounds and these swords and put thy hopes in miserable logs of wood? Let Egyptians and Phoenicians do their fighting at sea." But give us land on which we are accustomed to stand and either conquer or uh, our enemies or die. Beautiful phrase, by the way. So that indeed the Roman legionnaire wasn't much of a of a sailor by vocation initially, and, and surely was better deployed uh, deployed on land. Um, also, in the early empire, it was seen as raising the status of the naval soldiers when emperors incorporated them into the legions. 
right? So, uh, or per, mm, per example, it created uh, additional legions from amongst their numbers. Uh, such legions were normally titled as adiutriques, so uh, the aid, the helpers, literally, um, the help, the helping legions, and all of the conceptually of the of the Roman citizens of once, those who had at least become uh, more, you know, more regularly so. So conversely, it was a punishment for the Motinous soldiers to be incorporated into the naval forces, right? Um, as we've seen before, the stigma uh, remained in, at, at some levels. According to Suetonius, Nero made regular soldiers classiari or juxtimilites from rowers and marines of the Misenum fleet, enlisting them in a regular infantry corps. Also, when Galba wanted to return them to their former duties, they refused, because they had it better as legionnaires, and demanded back the eagle and standards. So they were slaughtered after a cavalry charge at the Milvian Bridge and the survivors decimated. However, there were still enough of these troops um, f um, left for Galba to form the nucleus of the first legion Adiutrix at the time and when Otto took power after the ass Galba's assassination he decided to invade Narbonensis Gaul by sea and his fleet according to Tacitus was quote a, s a stronger reliable army devoted to the cause so naturally these people could be turned into legionnaires also effectively. Uh, as we will see, that there's not a kind of a radical, uh, let's say, moral difference between what a, a legionnaire has to go through normally on, on, a, on a fighting ship, a warship, in a, in a naval battle, and on land. Albeit we should point out that naval battles were fairly rare, right? And that, generally speaking, we should mostly see as, for, for most, in fact, of, of these down the ancient medieval time, that uh, the naval operations were mostly kind of amphibious ones, right? So um, that's also what explains the fact that these troops were used also normally on foot as well, uh, you know, on land as well, as as normal legionaries in the same identical functions. And as we've seen, simply in some cases, they were literally the same people. Also, the... Um, Otho granted to all marines hopes of honorable service. He strengthened the legion with some uh, of the survivors of the Milvian Bridge Massacre, who had been imprisoned by Galba. By contrast, instead, the second legion, Adiutrix, was formed from amongst the elite of the marines of the Ravenna fleet whose crews were composed of Dalmatians, who passed, in turn, from Vitellus to Vespasian's service, demanding, ultimately, permission to serve in his legions. Right. So that was the ambition, generally speaking, or at this point. Over time, service um, in the naval arm, however, grew in importance and in status at the same time, Local Italians were even recruited as sailors of for provincial ships. So they they would basically ask that it was so crowded in in the Roman uh, in the two main Italian uh, fleets that they would ask to be enlisted in the provincial ones. And this tells how much you know demand there was for for those posts. Albeit the crews remained multinational, like on the long run there was no way at that point already by the, the, the first, the second century, you know, the, the, the properly the Italian, either from, from Italy or from um, Cisalpine Gaul, enlistments that decreased, right? Um, so, and also, generally speaking, usually foreigners were preferred, mostly for this most practical attitude some coastal peoples had already on their own as, as seamen. And during a naval clash on the Rhine during the rebellion of Civilis in 69 AD, the rebels attacked a squadron of the Rhine fleet, and the crews, um, mainly composed of the battalions and the, the two grins, 
um, this auxiliary corps joined the revolt and killed their Italic former comrades. Right, um, and that the main recruitment was amongst provincials uh, ra rather than the citizens is proved by numerous finds of chiefly military diplomas that were uh, the, the ones giving the, this man properly the Roman citizenship, optimo uh, jure, upon their discharge, as you know they would mostly serve for. Um, then we we easily spot them because you know there is no pride nomen of the father, right? Which instead of what usual uh, was usual in the case of citizens. Uh, also, epigraphic documents show that for most part the classiari were recruited in in provinces that were we've seen there was long seafaring tradition, mostly in the Hellenic speaking provinces such as Egypt, Asia Minor. Paphlagonia, Trace, and especially Syria, right, where the Lebanese ports also were. Um, and in Egypt, the recruitment of Hellenic citizens into the auxiliary militias was the rule, while, while a great number of native Egyptians proper were incorporated into the fleet, especially in the later centuries, as we often observed also in our widows on late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. The Latin-speaking countries favored for classiari recruitment were instead Sardinia, Corsica, right, Pannonia, and especially Illyria, uh, Dalmatia. This is kind of explains itself, right? Uh, so these are respectively uh, Tyrrhenian, Danubian, and Adriatic countries. So, Dio of Prusa in Bithynia remembered how in the 2nd century AD the Rhodians were obliged, that also had, had a, an important, the Rhodians resisted to the Romans for a long time in the, in, during the Republic. Eventually, you know, they still maintained part of their autonomy, they were obliged to provide the Roman fleet at Corinth with one or two small ships, but um, the author comments that since their previous obligations has been much greater, they should apply. Be happy that their duties had been so much uh, reduced. Uh, the terms of service naturally varied over time as well. Most military diplomas attest a length of service of 26 years, right after which the soldier was called a veteran, a veteran, and received a double pay. In the late Roman Empire, we'll talk about it in another time. This would be lengthened to 28. Uh, we, hold, we have a splendid specimen of military diplomas uh, to the Griga, of the Grigalis Lucius Bennius Beuza that was originally uh, Dalmatian and the, the diploma has been found in Vicus Habentia, right, modern uh, Vogenza in Italy. And this document is comparable to you know, a modern notarized certificate that uh, you know, attested by witnesses, they were engraved and two bronze tablets linked to, to like a booklet, right? And the the diploma conferred upon the recipient and his sons, because that was the point. That from now on, these would, would be Roman citizens without uh, doubt. Uh, the in fact, Roman citizenship and recognized also the veterans' manor, marriage, the connubium. That usually was actually the, the acknowledgement of a union which already existed, right? You also know that this happened in the, in for the legionaries themselves, that technically were not allowed, um, and also to even just to bring women in the barracks or to unite themselves. So with this, this, these things happened anyway, and they were formally sanctioned uh, just at the moment of discharge, and by the third century, I think they were allowed uh, finally. But it was already happening on a regular basis. Sometimes the women also inhabiting the barracks, right? Like, um, as you know, especially in the, in the most permanent bases. So, like the veterani of the land forces, the naval veterans could also be recalled to service at need. This happened to Nonius Calvisius of the Misenum fleet, who received the title of Veteranus Evocatus, so called back at Vocatus. And in, in the imperial period, while serving in the fleets, the marines had all the same legal rights as land troops. This is important. The Navarchi and Trierarchi were allowed 
to draw up their wills following military law. Each soldier received usual basic pay as attested, for example, in the gravestone of Didius Ruber, there was a Miles Sim Simplarius serving in the Ravenna fleet aboard to the trireme Neptunus. Right? What a name! Surprise! And their pay was augmented also in the case of prolonged service or through other gifts um, and case-specific uh, duties, in fact. So, um, we have evidence of marines with the qualification of duplicari or duplari, for example, and this corresponds to the distinction that um, the justice makes about uh, between the simplaris, uh, duplaris, and sesquiplaris in the land arm. That is, soldiers receiving either twice or or up to even six times the basic pay rate, at least. Uh, as for the legionnaires, the, the state supplied uh, the, the Navy's food and clothing, at least in part, right? We discussed this on some other occasion, but you know that, yeah, I mean, the state, theoretically, since the late Republic, began to produce stuff, etc., but it was never, like, to the fullest many legionnaires actually bought the things um, their, their own way with the money of the pay of course and this was even better in some in some cases um, anyhow the rations comprised um, special bread that was very simple to today's um, ships uh, biscuit that you find in fact in in the Mediterranean ancient medieval modern galleys basically in the same way because naturally they have this uh, high you know carbohydrates with a high uh, energetic level that could be you know compressed in uh, volumetrically so that they can fit the ships in, in large quantities and strong wine right strong wine is important as well um, and um, seems the seeming the biscuits were made of coarse floors uh, Plotus in the third century BC in the Miles Gloriosus states that sailors made heavy use of garlic and leeks in their diet as well it can be a naturally can prevent from uh, from in infections like you know intestinal diseases as I were you know dramatically frequent um, uh, and you can imagine what what was the life on a on a galley to uh, Pliny the elder state also that uh, Roman sailors drank a very poor wine Cato in his soldiery pride stating that he could drink even that right um, and as we've seen, aside from the service on fleets, sailors and marines alike were employed for a range of civil duties on land or at sea as well. Uh, for mm, from the time of Claudius, for example, two cohorts were permanently stationed in Puteoli, today's Pozzuoli, and Ostia, the port of Rome, to guard against the danger of fires. So, as firemen, as the vigilas that existed for the same purpose, by the way. Um, so there were these, you know, semi-institutionalized roles as police forces and so on. As it was actually, you know, the, the, you find the stuff among the legionnaires and the ter terrestrial forces at the same time, at many levels. Um, we've, we remember before the, the operation of the great velarium of the Colosseum by the sailors of the Mycenaean fleet, this was done by means of pulleys and ropes passing through one or more blocks, so it was something these guys were expert on for that reason. And we think the same velarium was used uh, in the Circus Maximus as well, because at the time of Commodus, we know that the emperor ordered the satyrs to slay some spectators that he believed were laughing at, them, at him. Uh, the classiari overall, so the classiari, as you understand, both the sailors and the marines, means that those belong to the, to the to the navy. By the third century, we know that the certain sailors were stationed specifically in in a quarter of Rome inside the city. Uh, they had various uh, specific tasks, for example, carrying money uh, and act actually weapons. Tell the truth often by means of boat uh, throughout the city. So they had important tasks, generally speaking. You know, the, the mob could mostly kept out, of course, of this business as much as they could. 
Uh, however, when on campaign on land, the Classiari participated together with the land troops in the construction, mostly of artworks, right? Uh, this is showed by multiple sources, uh, literary ones such as the pseudo Hyginus on his work on the fortifications of military camps, um, stating that at the, tra at the time of Trajan, the Classici, so the naval troops, were positioned at the head of the column of the troops, and it was their duty to go out first. So basically, to to open, clear the way for the rest of the army, and practically are acting as pioneers of later times. He he says, the Alae Miliariae and the Quingenariae are stretching out as well as the Equites Mauri, the Pannoni Veredari, and all the naval troops will first go out to clear the ways. Uh, dot 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 while working they are protect, protected by the Equites Mauri and the Pannoni Veredari and this description is, is, is very fascinating because it actually finds uh, the perfect match on what depicted on Trajan's column where we can see the Roman sailors represented beside their, their shields clearing the Dacian forest for the passage of, of the Roman army Many sources record the employment of the classiari in this building works. Thanks to their engineering capabilities, they had matured as, as sailors, as seamen, generally speaking. And we know of sailors of the African fleet taking part in the construction of a large aqueduct of Salta in modern Tunis uh, Tunisia, while the British fleet sent. Uh, a detachment to help in the construction of, of Hadrian's wall. Mm -hmm. So we find a specific building, uh, civilian building capability as well, S civilian and military alike. And uh, also an inscription from Salona mentions the sailors of the Trirene Concordia of the Ravenna fleet participating in the building of the city's walls. We know of a vexillatio of the Germanic fleet at Brawl that was uh, employed to the work in local quarries under uh, the command of a trierarchus, fulfilling the functions of a centurion. Also, we have a uh, 1982 discovery during the excavation at the harbor of Herculaneum. It's a skeleton found uh, sprawled face down on the pumice covered sand. It was a the the body of a man caught by the sudden eruption of the Vesuvius on August the twenty fifth seventy nine AD buried in uh, in this eight inches of ash basically um, and this sad event was however very important for archaeology because the guy was armed with a sword and dagger on military belts and had a bag of carpenter's tools that survived relatively intact. Amazing discovery. Uh, he was carrying the stuff on his shoulders enclosed in a leather bag that was slung on his back and together with the weapons we can see he uh, can identify him properly as a Faber Navalis, so as a naval uh, smith. Uh, the only possible fleet uh, in the region being the Classis Misenatis, right? Uh, he had uh, this, um, uh, in uh, warning the ventralis of his belt, gold and silver coins of the Emperor Nero, right? So it's the time. And the skeleton also had uh, missing three teeth who knows how lost how possibly in a fight um, and there was an abnormal lump in the femur as well in his left leg that might have actually been a, a war wound a stabbing wound maybe of just of a brawl um, and also you know the the around the shaft of the femur was a sign of good nutrition right uh, he was mm, kind of a muscular uh, man and he is Adductor tubercle was slightly enlarged, uh, possibly uh, because as a marine soldier carpenter he 
would have had to hold heavy timbers between his knees. So the general impression is that the fighting satyrs and embark troops were slightly better dressed than normal infantry. Um, naturally, it was in part a more usuring job in a way. Um, the equipment also clothes, just banal, you know, to resist better to to the elements, to to salt uh, water, to to the winds and so on. Cassius Dio specifically speaks of the use of the pachea matia, that is, heavy clothes, hmm, for this um, purpose. There was naturally a wide range of uh, climate types that the, the satyrs had to to operate in. For example, the crews of the Nautai Parisiaki, so in northern Gaul, are shown with heavy cloaks of the Painula and Lacerna type, while the sailors of the Danubian fleet, uh, represented in Trajan's columns, are clad in a typical short-sleeved or sleeveless tunic with a bunched knotted neck. Now, the Trajan's column is a very propagandistic uh, picture, so many people, you know, take it as, you know, what the Romans basically were at the time. Archaeologically speaking, we're told very different stories. So these have made, because the Danube, banally speaking, not even wherever it go across it, of course, the war was fought mostly during the good season, but it's not that it's particularly, you know, hot weather, that matter. Um, uh, and e even in, actually in the warmest areas of, of the empire, you would think, you know, in certain cases that they might have had to need to, to be at least this, the satyrs disposing of, of heavier uh, garments are, could turn out useful in some occasions. The tunic on the Trajan column was worn like an Hellenic exomis, leaving the right shoulder uncovered. It was a practical garment for manual workers, also we know at the time, soldiers, and also sailors and fishermen, in fact. We know from certain Athenian gravestones that uh, marines also wore sleeveless tunics and the sagum cloak. Statius um, Rufinus, the tombstone of whom was found in uh, Keramikos Cemetery in, a in Athens, was probably Hellenic in origin. He served as a classiarius of the Misenum fleet in the mid-2nd century AD. He wears this sagum with a small tassel visible on the lower left corner. In a papyrus letter from Caranus that we also talk about a bit later, dating from the first half of the 2nd century AD, the classiarius Claudius Terentianus, uh, that we know serving, served on the Alexandria fleet in Egypt, at uh, least stationed in Egypt, thanks his father for a pinul, so uh, uh, um, uh, also a tunica and a fas and fasciae for the legs, and also thanks him uh, because of of this, the descending of the Beerus Castellinus, which was a short mm, cloak of some sort, and uh, but here there is properly philological um, you know problems of interpretation it could even be castorinus actually so a, a beer is made of beaver skin that might have been worn at sea who knows um, also he asks a lot of things actually um, a tunica brachilis that is with sleeves and brachii so these short trousers and so that correspond to um, generally speaking, to, with the images of 2nd century tombstones and also with other representations of the classiari, for example, on the Trajan's column, right, wearing these short trousers or feminali, as we're called this time, used also by other, uh, other legionnaires and the auxilia. You know that the Romans took the mm, trousers essentially from 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 the sand, from the Celtic world, most. Um, like those of ordinary soldiers, the pinolite cloaks of marines came under in, in shorter and longer versions as well. We know it from certain uh, representations in Severian times. 
but here they're a bit too late for our our taste. As we know, the Joseph Pine rolled up as a sagam and worn with a small tunic visible on the second century monument of Hon Honoratus, a classiarius of the Ravenna fleet. Were sandals, and he used the Caligae famously as military, the normal military shoes, uh, widely attested by both stelae and ar other archaeological finds from the first three centuries of the empire. Uh, the most ancient specimens come from Comacchia, Valle Ponti, um, where we we found properly a ship. And this footwear was strong, fast and high on the ankle, low cut, sometimes firm, furnished with nails for a better grip, and also dressed internally with a small sock or slipper, soft leather, and shoes were often worn with woolen socks, right, a detail that we find on the tombstone of statues uh, um, Rufinus and in the above-mentioned uh, Egyptian papyrus. In another letter to his father, Terentianus actually means a pair of low-cut leather boots and a pair of udones, or felt stockings, right? And and all these demands of the guy to, to his father, and we, we have a lot of this stuff of other also legionnaires that wrote home and telling that their family sent me this, this and that socks, you know, stuff. Naturally, makes you wonder how these guys were equipped as well, right? And you understand the even at the height of the empire, the complementarity of different, uh, you know, both style production slash distribution, but also private means and or simply, sometimes legionaries actually made their, their stuff up in their own, right? You know, they, they had their workshops there. Uh, mostly they spent time doing not much, actually, you know. Unfortunately for them, it was not a dramatically... Uh, mortal job to be a, a Roman legionnaire this time, and um, not even properly for for military reasons. So there were many other ways they would buy stuff from local producers as well, and so on. We know of Caliga. He also showed on the feet of the Optio Montanus in the second half of the first century AD. Uh, they they remain pretty standard also. For up to the third century. Other, there is a lot of footwear here. Maybe it's not such, uh, you know, different types of boots. Other, you know, smaller types as well. Uh, the use of the calque is confirmed also by the request addressed to Emperor Vespasian by the sailors of the Misenum fleet detached to work on the uh, the Colosseum canopy. Right, um, that uh, required to to be paid uh, higher uh, for the calciarium or boot money proper, so it was a thing because of the frequent wear of their shoes on the march from Naples to Rome. Right, so you understand how, you know, not so standardized it was film. This whole thing was after all, was was it? Terms of production, etc. It was. Sometimes even the, the donativa, right? All these gifts were the donations unatantum, right? Depending on also, as we've seen, the, this this man had their own military importance even in in, in the surroundings of Rome. So there were people you would like also to, to to treat in a certain way, specifically, and they knew they could ask. You know, but you know what? What do you think that the, the sailors of the Milesian fleet asked to the emperor the, the money for their boats? Well, that that's important, and you know. Uh, that you know that's what every military man knows um and it's kind of it's very ironic actually that um the uh, the trip the emperor ordered them to march barefoot because even you know it, it uh, you may even be surprised by how much can people adapt to march barefooted in, in the, but obviously the, you know less uh, romantic in it sounds, but still, it's uh, you know it was a way to say you're you're soldiers. So there was a completely different physicality also at the time. It, it, we have no idea of it in terms of just of mindset. Pliny the uh, the elder, uh, on the day of his famous death, uh, commander of the Misenum fleet was wearing simple boots called solei. Right. There were. Also, various kinds of hats and caps, right? 
typically used by naval personnel. If you go sailing ships, you you know how here that that, uh, that sun is 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 annoying, and the the pilos, also conical felt hat used to, since the Etruscan age in Roman, you know, is often represented in figurative monuments related to soldiers, right? Lots of things naturally that spread all over the Mediterranean just as basic forms and um, for practice as they were practical. Um, ah, the, the the thing of the colors, you know that we made some video about the, the colors of the Roman army, uniform, all this stuff, it's very broad, so we will not take rest. But of course the, the simple answer is, and uh, most, you know, Pacific one is properly we do not know. Um, nor what kind of colors, uh, or better, we know what kind of colors they wore, but we, we have no idea whether to work somewhat standardized in, in, in some ways, uh, even in here, probably there was a lot of uh, you know customization, uh, maybe at the unit level, not necessarily individual level, but still, it was perhaps the one of dice across the Roman state all altogether, considering that the huge expanse of the army that basically absorbed most of the, the, the Roman um, uh, ones uh, of the imperial ones uh, was not even you know thought concrete. But we know mostly of the sailors we're wearing these bluish colors. This is what we often say. Uh, we think that there could be specific clothing colors identifying the nautai, uh, the, the classiari, broadly meant, and the naval commanders. Right. And in the consular period, Plautus, writing about the ordinary Sailors mentions this iron gray color in a description of the Nauta, of, of uh, Nauta's dress. Yeah, he he says, "Take care to come here dressed in the garb of a master of a ship. Have on a broad rimmed hat of iron gray, a, a woolen shade before your eyes. Have on an iron gray cloak, for that is the seaman's color, right." Have it fastened over the left shoulder, your right arm pro projecting out of your clothes some way well geared up. Pretend that you're some master of a ship. So sailors also retained their seemingly for, for their preference for an iron gray or dark color of sort in imperial times as well. Blue seems to have been the favor color for the marines, uh, at least uh, for the senior ranks that uh, are also somewhat better documented. Sky blue was also associated with the navy because it was linked with Neptune, god of, of, of the oceans. Cassius Dio states that a cerulean blue cloak or costume was the prerogative of the victorious admiral in this sense. In 43 BC, Sextus Pompeius received from the Senate the title of Praefectus Classi et Orae Maritimae, which is Admiral of the Fleet and Roman Shores, and wore a mid-blue cloak, according to both Appianus and Cassius Dio. This Venetus purple, because gold like this, was the color sacred to Neptune. Right, I don't know. This comes from, you know, that the Veneti existed both uh, as a name of peoples, one in northeastern Italy, one in northwestern fr uh, France, the Gaul at the time, and um, and it was this bluish, like between, say, blue and, and green, and dark call, seeming. Also, after his uh, naval victory over Octavian off the coast of Sicily. We never talked about Sextus Pompeius, this very underestimated figure. He basically created this, not properly pirate uh, power, but uh, based in Sicily and even managed to defeat, in fact, Agrippa's um, fleet and the Octavian attempt, to, uh, Octavian's attempt in this sense of, uh, at some point um, of, of Sicily. Quote, believing himself in very truth to be the son of Neptune, and put a dark blue robe. Sextus Pompeius had transformed himself in this properly, you know, 
maritime, everything was concerned now is naval power because it was the only way to protect his islands that Oct Octavian will get anyway, anyhow at some point in the time of Lepidus though. Um, the same colors are mentioned actually for Agrippa's clothing. You know, Agrippa, the most famous admiral in, uh, you know, in this context and uh, Octavian's uh, friend and uh, man of trust and factotum and, and, and relative eventually. And um, at least he, we we get this information from a uh, from the Palestrina mosaic. At least, if Fuentes' indication is correct, Fuentes suggests also that a scarf was used as a means of identification. Uh, it's possible, in this sense, Marines would wear a blue scarf, um, and um, that uh, the legions levied from the Marines maintained. The, the color, but it's just an hypothesis. Also, there may have been various shades of blue that um, might were naturally also not the only colors employed. We have traces of red, for example, in certain funerary monuments of marines of the Misenum Mise fleet, which show this red-brown color of um, Actually, the Praetorian soldiers who, who were probably employed for the units of the uh, um, units of Italic origins, which which also served at sea in that context. So that have, may have come still from, from from the external, in a way. From the gravestone of Julius Sabinianus, there was a classiarius of a detachment of the Misenum fleet in based in Athens. We find traces of red visible, at least, you know, they were once, uh, on both his tunic and cloak. And white seems instead to have been a prerogative of the Eastern fleet. Suetonius mentions an episode in which, quote, it happened that from an Alexandrian ship which had just arrived there, the passengers and sailors, clad in pure white, crowned with garlands and burning incense lavished upon Augustus good wishes and the highest praise, saying that it was through him that they sailed the seas. In fact, white is the most visible color for the tunics in the Fayum portraits of the 1st and 2nd century um, uh, too, uh, right? And many of the soldiers portrayed in here uh, could be members, in fact, of, of the Alexandrine fleet. Um, a theory supported by the fact that they, uh, many of them, also wear blue cloaks, right? So there could even be a combination of the same colors together. Um, like their counterparts on land, uh, marine centurions had their, as their main symbol of authority, the visit of wine staff, that as you know was uh, the only uh, type of of, uh, of material uh, with which allegedly a Roman citizen could be beaten, because there were specific rights of Roman citizens who were this time almost religiously, in fact, properly religiously held. And we find different sizes of these staffs on gravestones, um, sometimes shorter with a bowl like end, such as on the monument of Annius Severus, and a longer, typically twisted type, like the normal legion uh, centurion's um, staffs uh, on, on land, carried by Aemilius Severus. So these are a bit older witnesses. Famously, the main military de decoration for Roman admirals who won great naval victories was the corona rostrata, right? A golden crown ornamented with the prows of the, the ships, the rostra, the ones that used to break through the enemy uh, hulls, visible in combination with castellated corona muralis on the head of Agrippa in coins of 18 BC were used for, uh, you know, after you know storming a, a city and the uh, with literally the you know the the city walls were represented in there, and you you have to imagine a naval battle at that time actually not being very very different from it because the, the, these 
the Roman ships had whole different towers. The the various ships you will see it better uh, later. You know, were all compacted, stuck together. It was a lot of boarding, ramming, and so on. So it was like fighting on this city on sea, right? Of of wood and metal, and with these towers that you know through all the stuff imaginable, just as you know, normal city towers on land, fortresses on land. The Ocasius claims that this double award, so the Rostrata and the Muraria crown, was, quote, in the case of Agrippa, in fact, uh, eventually never attributed to anyone else, either before or after, and objectively Agrippa stands as the, the greatest admiral in, in Roman history. Uh, this, this early Roman times, and among the other military decorations, the sources naturally mention also the um, Corona Navalis awarded to victorious imperator who achieved success in, you know, against an enemy fleet, or allegorically against the ocean proper, right? And in fact, also the same Agrippa is shown on the simple uh, on coins with a simpler naval crown sometimes. Ordering soldiers who were victors in sea battles were given um, a simpler crown of olive leaves. At some point we'll have to make a video about properly this, you know, the, the various types of uh, crowns. That they also, you know, varied over time. They right? were not so categorically defined. And also their attribution, also matters of ranks and status, uh, made uh, the difference over time. Um, the general impression given by the monuments and sources about the classic milites and the fighting satyrs is that um, they were somewhat lighter troops compared to the average um, Roman uh, true, you know, soldier at the time, and that also they were equipped with a wider variety of weapons. Cassius Dio states that Octavian's marines were good swimmers and had light equipment, for example. Uh, this may be connected naturally to the fact that um, that the well, we can't go in detail with that today, but you know, the, all the ramming maneuvers, etc., um, contemplated not just the ship doing something, but literally the marines on board, like to 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 shift on on the deck uh, very quickly. Right to to counterbalance all the forces and to deliver uh, the boat. So it was something very complex, very complicated, generally speaking. So obviously there were even heavier uh, equipped troops, but also the risk of falling in the water, not being able to get rid of your armor being uh, taken um, uh, to the bottom. It was 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 uh, was real. Um, but uh, generally speaking, as you know, uh, this depended also. First of all, in this type of battle was fought. You know, ramming and boarding were universal tactics at the time. Artillery also, but naval artillery was or arrows, etc., were never enough to to get rid of the enemy ships practically. So uh, this hand-to-hand -hand reality was was out there, um, and uh, still the the average would be lighter for simply this maneuvering need also for. You know, I'm thinking of various possibilities, but uh, I, fighting at sea naturally puts, generally speaking, more strains than in other conditions, I believe. Also, um, considering the, the various um, elements involved uh, in, in the wall, and also this um, some, what safety need in case you, you fall into the water. But that's relative... It, considering what you have to do, you know, if you have to assault an enemy ship fighting the deck, you, you want to be well protected as well. So, of course, it was heavy equipment proper, right? Um, and um, it seems that their equipment on average was even lighter, not just in infantry, but even in cavalry, right? Others, as we just stated, were mm, other marines were heavily equipped. And that's the uh, the, the diff one difference, for example, between the unarmed marines and the embarked oplitae, as was said in, in the Hellenic sources. Artistic sources of the first century BC also provide evidence of use of um, Montefortino genon type helmets, uh, late Hellenistic types, with complete with cheek guards. So, actually, just like uh, you know terrestrial troops, as these troops also wearing 
could be employed, were employed actually very often. Also, the Praeneste uh, ship relief today preserved in the Vatican Museum um, that comes from the funerary mon monument of an Antonian Navarca actually is one of the best known sources for the uh, maritime equipment of the late Republican period. The soldiers represented here were Attic uh, shaped, at least, helmets of and other Hellenic typology. Uh, sometimes provided with uh, metallic crests, other classiari are wearing etrusco corinthian helmets used by the Romans since the Age of Kings. So this could be also pretty stylicized uh, representations, as you understand, but we know they were there. We also made a video on, uh, on Roman helmets and specifically on Hellenic influence once. Um, s just some of the helmets are also pertinent to the original sculptures. Right, the the heads uh, were restored in the 19th century. It tended to imitate the originals, but never quite. They were not presumably not quite the same. Um, one original still in place shows, however, the use of side feathers on a Etrusco Corinthian helmet. And the Nautai Parisiaki that we have seen before also represented in the famous mm, pilaster of the of Tiberian date from the Ile de la Cité in Paris are wearing simple helmets, right? Possibly of Carlos Mannheim type or even felt caps as, as we were saying before. Uh, one of the soldiers of the uh, uh, Audiotrix, uh, Audiotrix Legion represented in Mainz, the Mainz column base is uh, wearing an incised helmet of imperial Gallic pattern, the so-called Bisonel type. We made a a video also in various Roman imperial helmets, with a dolphin engraved on it, right? This kind of um, decorations are kind of typical of, uh, in this case of a naval symbol, but, you know, there were various differentiations all over the various provinces and so on, uh, depending on kind of even local styles. And um, is there is also a shell fibula that fastens the cloak of the sick Nefer represented on the other pilaster in the same monument. Right, so all maritime, uh, on all uh, sea-based, let's say, as as a motive. The marines um, naturally retained, while we can see images and symbols of mm, the power of Neptune and their equipment. The marine officers fighting against the barbarians on the Danube on the uh, sarcophagus. Um, on a sarcophagus uh, dated either from to the 1st or 2nd century AD have old uh, Italic helmets complete with gemini pinnae and a rigid horse hair crest. There are different types on the aforementioned Prynesta ship relief as well. Uh, a warrior with an Etrusco Corinthian helmet wears a muscled cuirass in metal or molded leather, we don't know with a simple row of linen lappets. Uh, the other, uh, on on the prow of the ship, actually does the same. The use of a lighter leather armor, as you know, is controversial, but is, is attested, and it would be mm, practical for the mobility required for fighting on, on board ship, as we were saying before. Yet, metal armor could still be worn in that sense. Um, and... Uh, the, the problem of falling overboard, overboard remaining anyhow uh, for in, in the latter case. Um, and we we don't have to think in this sense that just the armor was everything because we know that naturally in the ancient world the same legionnaires on land sometimes abandon armor to to attack more quickly and you know, march more quickly in some cases. So um, Cassius Dio wrote that Octavian's men at Actium were well protected by their armor against enemy blows. On that occasion, uh, let's say, uh, Antonius' men were mostly about boarding and uh, Octavian's mostly about ramming. So they, they would actually, you know, Octavian's ones would try to, to avoid the, uh, even the hand-to-hand -hand fight and basically crashing as you see better into the enemy hulls and then disengaging the heads specific metal plates uh, to, to disengage more quickly because otherwise they could remain stuck and they would uh, anyhow impart into the enemy ship's things and at that point the enemy could counterattack by boarding in turn 
Um, so naturally, missile fire was all over the place in here, right? You have to imagine this battles like you know, literally everything crossing the hair every moment. We'll see it better later. Uh, the senior officers of the second row of the Pernesta relief, that was perhaps a fleet prefect, uh, and probably the same uh, commissioner, at least you know the the, the person for w which the monument was was created wears this splendid Hellenic uh, thorax lepidotus or scale armor that was actually in used by the Romans since ever like it was not a an eastern prerogative you find it all over the Mediterranean uh, since the beginning uh, of, of Roman history furnished with shoulder pieces and a double skirt of the fringed pterygus you know these kind of decorations and uh, knotted in his breast there is also uh, the so-called knot of Hercules. Um, that the, the is the, is basically the, the so-called zona militaris, the clothes sash widely employed by the Hellenic office by Hellenic officers as well. As you know, as we were saying before, also the, the Romans had this dramatic Hellenic influence at this time in their equipment, just aesthetically, artistically speaking. We even have a rare find of a Roman ship, the ship that confirms the use of, of metal muscled armor on uh, on that occasion, so it's quite important. Um, this is a bronze piece, specifically, recovered in Spain, in Cuevra del Yarro, from a Roman shipwreck, um, associated also with amphorae types of uh, that help us to date it something between the 1st and 3rd century AD. Uh, it might have been part of a ship's of officer's uh, armor, or equally even a marine armored like those of the Pernesta relief. So it's quite fascinating. The funerary stale of Optio Montanus from Classe shows a muscle cuirass, right, with other decorative pterages and shoulder on the shoulders and skirt of fringe strips. But anyhow, this is just another witness of the type of armor. It can be interpreted as the representation of subarma, that it is an under armor garment, by the way. It could be made even of felt or of linen. That uh, the, in fact, the sculpture took great care to represent specifically as both thick and padded. And the marine officers and the um, on the above mentioned Danube battle sarcophagus also wear muscled breastplates. Right of either metal or leather, we, we can't tell from the relief. Uh, naturally, aside from uh, cuirasses made of leather or metal, we, we have late Republican and early imperial monuments representing marines protected by armors made of, um, in other forms, uh, specifically heavy strips of padded material, probably felt. Corslets of felt or pressed linen forming uh, armors shaped in Egyptian styles are also represented. Some terracottas, um, terracotta reliefs preserved at the British Museum. They, they have been usually associated to the Battle of Actium. We don't know what is mostly that period, anyhow. Um, they the used padded material as body protection is, uh, you know, went on in the Roman Navy just up to the Middle Ages, you know, and. Uh, think even the Roman legionaries after all they had even if they didn't have this dramatic evidence of it. Um, the the advancing legionary on the mines column base is protected only by high heavy tunic superimposed with another furnished with short sleeves as well. Uh, we know of later metallic versions of the Lorica segmentata as well in the first and second century AD uh, from one relief uh, of uh, in uh, from Madrid, um, once collection of the Duke of Medina, and this was restored in uh, modern times. It represents a naval battle, where the Marines um, ha are clad in such lorikai and protected by uh, rectangular shields, while also throwing missiles and shooting arrows. This is fascinating. The armor is worn even in there on a subarmale furnished with lappets and hanging pterages. This 
reveals, you know, that the, the idea of the logical segmentator is just mostly, yeah, it was better against a uh, projectile. Other three fighters are clad in muscle armor. Again, probably of leather, this occasion too. On Trajan's column, we have the equipment of two marines depicted transferring supplies um, to a small river boat, which appears to be very light, and they're cla clad in uh, leather in short male corslets with scalloped edges. And they, they have their own swords hanging from the right side of the body, like uh, those of regular legionnaires as well. Sources of the 1st century BC also attest the use of rectangular and oval scuta by the marines, wearing only short tunics. Uh, this is interesting, of course, all the types of shields were used in armors, and every kind of equipment was used by any kind of Roman unit everywhere. Um, naturally in different um, ways, but the subdivision of, uh, you know, of, I don't know, probably the legions were better equipped, but this has nothing to do with whether, for example, the auxiliaries wouldn't wear the same legion equipment. We know they did, right, sometimes, and actually on a regular basis, so... But we discussed this elsewhere. I will not make the usual <laughs> um, rant about it. We we also have the barely horn shield of Fayum uh, type uh, that um, still employed was still employed by Marines by the late first century BC, depicted in one of those British Museum terracotta reliefs. The shields of the marines representing the Praneste Byrim are oval scuta. And they are important for also, um, representation also for the blazons of naval soldiers that we discussed in the video on the, the blazons of the Roman army shield patterns. Some have engraved motives um, and um, they strikingly depict a hand holding Neptune's trident and the wings of an eagle. This is also, I think, the picture I will insert as a um, as a thumbnail because that's how we mostly like to to think the you know, Augustan type uh, marine, uh, the Augustan times Mar Roman marine. There are diff some you know grip systems here, it's not very important to discuss, but you know the the interesting aspect of the blazons um, relate to those of the Antonian legions. Interestingly, others instead represent vegetal spirals and wings. They have similarities with uh, shields engraved upon, for example, the monuments of uh, Narbonne in southern Gaul, um, which are probably devices of Caesar's uh, second legion Alaudae and the eleventh legion fighting for for Octavian. The shield with Neptune's trident is certainly the device of a marine legion, right? Because uh, this is to be found on monuments of the imperial period representing properly the glaciari or, and also troops from the Adutricus legions. Also, the figures of the Nautai Parisiaki of uh, Tiberian times have oval and rectangular shields of uh, Celtic type, interestingly enough, fitted with circular bosses, so naturally these troops were also, as we've seen, recruited at the time mostly from the locals, so they would have their own equipment, in, in part, other provided by the Romans. Um, they also have spears and heavy folded tunics, similar to the ones uh, repicted on, on the Mines monument. In fact, the legionaries of, on the Mines column base are probably men from, as we've seen, from the first Adutrix legion, and have rectangular convex shields, uh, typical, you know, the, the most iconic Roman legionnaire we see uh, in our imaginary, let's say. And their blazon uh, seems to be uh, a metallic, uh, made in, uh, as a, in metallic application and stylicizes the winged eagle of Jupiter. The marine's shields engaged in road building in the 68th scene of Trajan's column are hexagonal in shape, decorated with vegetal and floral patterns, and in a trident as well, so here Neptune's um, iconic uh, symbology uh, returns. Um, there are other symbols, actually, the, the um, votive 
altar for the second Adutrix legion from Pannonia Superior records the winged horse of Pegasus. There was another famously another Ctonic uh, and actually a Polynic uh, and Heavenly at the same time uh, uh, and being coming from the sea and being in fact connected to Neptune as well. And there is a very interesting depiction of some stelae, which uh, might be of also even of ladder shields, so something lighter, as it was used in you know in other troops somewhere. And uh, uh, there is uh, naturally even in here, as we've seen, a, a lot of room for whatever any of those Peregrinian troops that were enlisted as sailors uh, would bring, uh, especially from the east. Uh, in terms of offensive weapons, we know of, of a Hasta Navalis, which is mentioned among the various types of spear in late Republican times. Um, it's shaped, it's possibly visible on a relief uh, dated to the first half, first century BC that shows Roman marines equipped with shields, provided with a boss and a raised spine, Morte Fortino helmets, in a spear with a wide triangular blade. Right? Actually, the same depicted on the Praneste uh, monument. Pila are, of course, mentioned in sources of early empire as used in naval clashes. Uh, already in, in land battles, you know, as you know, most of the hand-to-hand -hand fighting went on for, for very few minutes. They, these battles lasted for hours, an entire day. Uh, most of the time would be spent actually skirmishing, even with Pila. Yes, you don't think that the, the pilum is this specific weapon that you use just in the, the attack in that the concerted fashion. Actually, we have no proof of that. I have to make a massive video on the pilum because uh, aside from the, the various changes that this also underwent in various types that existed, you have to consider more openly the, properly its own use. Um, so these were legionaries, as all others as we've seen, they, they would use it in in this context as well the equipment of the satyrs in the paris movement is actually very similar as i've already noticed to the one of celtic auxiliaries from late republican and, and early augustian times spears and swords uh, loaded on a ship are visible on a stone fragment representing a ship on the seine river the senior officer on the prenester relief is armed just with one sword, worn on a with a uh, on a baldric crossing his right shoulder, there are similar details on a coin of 46-45 BC representing Gnaeus Pompeius on the deck of a warship, right? And when Tacitus describes the murder of Agrippina by a centurion, famously, um, and a triarchus of marines, the centurion of Baritus is armed with a pugio. So the small, um, in fact, uh, say, book, I don't know, know to say it in English, but it's a better knife, basically. And while the Tererarch Herculeus carries a cudgel, we have even a good scabbarded specimen of sword found in the Herculaneum marine's body we were seeing before. Um, and the, the this, this single-edged weapon of Pompeian type was placed on the right side of the body, and Apugia was still attached to to a second-bladed uh, kingdom. Right. It's very it's what stereotypical, but it, it is true they they objectively wore it in in that way. It was more standard, perhaps. We we're just very lucky we found the match, but uh, so it is. It's very natural, as that unfortunate story was. The Italian fleet's marines seem to have equipped with fairly costly items that were not solely reserved to the officers, as we've seen the, the, the customization of equipment was much higher than we think, and these were, as we've seen, privileged at some point um, troops. In many ways, people wanted to join uh, the navy, uh, and that posted even just for, by searching uh, places uh, in, in, in the provincial uh, one, uh, you know, bases, and uh, we have a civil plate belt and sword scabbard thick things, for ex example, um, that were produced by local smiths around Misenum. We uh, there are various um, 
Various finds. One of the officers of the Danube fleet, represented a second century AD sarcophagus, has uh, a knife, even with a slightly curved blade. That, as you know, by the time of, you know the areas of the Dacians and the Thracians was something more, more common. Also in other lands in Central Europe, the famous Dolapra, this axe picket, basically was uh, one of the favorite weapons of marines, right? As it was actually throughout all you know axes throughout all the look at medieval modern, even contemporary era, up to very recent times, uh, for for boarding, actually. Um, it was used by the Dolatores to cut the ropes and sails of the enemy ships, uh, not just to fight. Uh, and in this dramatic hand-to-hand -hand combat, naturally, that required very close distances, and, you know, even, you know, attacking people were armored and coming to grips with them at short range, and did this uh, blunt weapons as well. Um, blunt and cutting effect at the same time with the axe specifically. And consider, um, you know, also other, you know, the, you know, the very dynamic fencing in this deck fights. Cassius Theo states that sailors at the Battle of Actium were armed with axes. In the above mentioned letter from Caranis, uh, 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 Terentianus asks his father for a battle sword, an axe, a grapnel, and two spears. So a hell of an equipment, actually. <laughs> and and the, the list keeps adding to all the stuff that theoretically the state should have provided him and that he's actually asking to his family. So that's interesting as well. And this request also suggests that actually his father had enough money to also supply him with these things and good quality equipment in general. There's a next surviving letter from the Saint Terentianus in which he asks for a dolabre, in fact, the axe picket, because uh, the first had been appropriated by his optium. <laughs> this is fascinating. Uh, so that tells you also how you know uh, an NCO could get his uh, equipment, that getting it from you know the private means of of, of the troops under his command. Uh, there are naturally bows and slings like crazy as you can imagine in a in a ship uh, in a naval a naval warfare in general. Uh, there were surely lots of archers and slingers embarked together with the heavily armed uh, hope hope lights, let's say, with the marines with the heavily armored troops. And we know of this towers, uh, as we were saying before, that figured, uh, you know, as properly these imposing fortresses arising from the, from the decks and um, targeting the enemy sh ships, enemy decks, because rising above level was to shoot in, in over the enemy deck without the, the protection of the all of the walls. Um, and uh, Octavian seemingly preferred especially heavily armored infantry. Right. During the Battle of Actium, the Antonians bombarded the approaching ships with dense showers of stones and arrows, as well as cast iron grapnels, the so-called iron hands. We also have evidence of, of long pikes, the, the conto, the, the contos proper, that return uh, in naval warfare at many levels, many times in history. We um, apparently used in fighting between sailors and marines, but they could have also other functions, we found them in Byzantine military manuals, also by the eight, the tenth century. In that context, specifically, not knowing what layout it was, not knowing specifically what use it was, but it was connected to the to the level of the oars, you know. And but this is not important. But just for saying that were it was literally all the kind of equipment in there that should make us reconsider. I mean, consider in general also that the fact that all these weapons were normally used not just for, you know, um, at sea, right. Preferably here, for some reason, we can't quite grasp at sea as well. Uh, but because of the mechanics involved in the fights, of the physicality, the structures, the ships, but there are some uses you can't think. But these were same troops that fought on, on, on foot as well, so we can't easily think that a Roman legionnaire was trained actually even to fight with pikes. What's, what's strange with that, right? Actually, you know, we, we see it in every single time in history, even by the peasantry, where you think that a Roman legionnaire didn't. But we have stereotyped the fact that the pike is just a Macedonian fox and nothing else. No, it's actually not true at all. Um, and this has 
very different, however, from, from you know, enlarging the whole thing to certain specific tactics and military systems, but it, it's still a weapon and it was there, it was used, of course. So, if we were to talk um, conclusion about naval warfare at the time broadly meant, um, from the Punic Wars onwards, this is a topic we never discussed, we'll have to do it at some point, multiple videos on this, because it's very fascinating. But uh, the practice was basically to transfer um, the, 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 the land tactics to the naval environment. Right? Rome was famous for this because of the Carvi, the ravens that, you know, properly, uh, you know, uh, the gang, gang planked, the, the, planked the, the, the ship's extremities to, to take it from their own side and boarding them. But boarding and ramming were the universal... Uh, you know, naval tactics since the times of the Egyptians and the Sea People. So um, it's not that just the Romans did this, right? It was something normal uh, in some ways. And also, the idea of the Corvus is uh, mm, uh, it's been criticized at least. Not that you think it didn't actually exist or or happen, but still, the it's um, it would be difficult now to explain properly why it's. Uh, it's it's not unlikely, but still, it wasn't this dramatic uh, technicality that that made the Romans winning the, the Punic Wars at, at sea. It, 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 there was much more to uh, to that to be added, actually. Um, and also, in fact, we shouldn't think Roman naval warfare to be dramatically different. Actually, it was pretty homogeneous to, to the rest of the other peoples. As even the Punic Wars basically tell us in, in a way or in another. So. A lot of stereotypes, a lot of prejudices, it happens to me to, to, to meet a lot of people that just don't want to listen about this, but uh, that's why we'll have to talk about it in detail at some other point. Um, the carvus, as you know, was the structure, you know, being attached and raised like like a, a bridge, like a pond to the pivoting uh, post at about 8 meter high, right, at the ship's bow and or stern. And uh, it was a boarding bridge proper, about 1.2 meters wide, made up in two sections with parapets on either side, so that the, the troops wouldn't fall uh, during the assault. And apparently the end was civelled out and dropped by means of a rope and pulley, driving a spike under the end into the enemy's ships or ship's deck. And so this enabled two rows of troops to cross over, um, protected by their own shields and the parapets as well. Um, there is a lot of questionability about mostly uh, what, how could a, a ship remain stable, right? Well, with this, not just during that specific maneuver that at least you know made, uh, you know, based the corvus on on both ships, the enemies and in the friendly one, but properly during transportation. Um, during the Punic Wars, the uh, many Roman ships uh, shipwrecked and may be connected to it in part. Um, however, we Vitruvius, at least writing in Augustan times, still speaks of the Corvus, right, among the various marinae machinae, so the, the maritime uh, engines used for for boarding among the others, not all. And you before battle was usual to order the rowers to let their oars rest in the water, right? Also because, you know, at some point these guys had to remain more or less, uh, you know, exploiting the inertia to, to remain idling with the work, with maintaining more stability to the ship at some levels. And the eventually when the attack began, fleets would try to advance with both of their wings like it was um, it was not very difficult from a from different from us from a land fight in many ways it was conceived in, in even in less maneuverable way to try to it was an iron arm between these very thickly packed formations of ships it wasn't much sophistication for maneuvering where c is um is very complicated so there are certain things you simply can't do the wind doesn't obey to, uh, to your orders um so certain maneuvers those in other naval battles would consider as very sophisticated it was just you know because they had the wind there at the moment it could do it or just maybe it was the only thing they could do uh also 
Mm, now, let's not talk about how the sales were employed. This is we'll stick to the Marines. Uh, the point is that where the the enemies, the enemy fleets would crash, would uh, you know uh, clash against each other. Of course, there would be this solid blocks of that would try to 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 push and to to break into the enemy lines. But in the meanwhile, the troops would try to to, to board each other, to to ram and to board each other, if possible. Um, ramming was coupled naturally with the use of artillery as well to set fire to the enemy ships. Uh, at Actium, this was used. We're told that Antony built on his ships some lofty towers, and he had put aboard a large number of men who could thus fight from the walls, right? And um, so it, that was the problem. That, that it was f- like forming a fortress on water that couldn't be broken through. But this, uh, on the other hand, the, the thicker they were, the, the easier they were for artillery. And also for ramming, uh, at some levels. So, um, the um, Octavian's more maneuverable Liburni uh, had more game in, in 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 a way, right? But you don't have to think that you know they, they went back and forth. Nothing worked. You know, it was still something very difficult to control overall. Um, they they managed, however, to to set blades by incendiary missiles. The with their own, with their own catapults uh, placed on uh, on the decks, the the enemy the enemy ships, the Antonian ships, um, and although Smolens with there, um, as we were uh, hinting at before, Octavian's ships were all armored on on all sides, right? So this um, m- made them capable of ramming in part as well, and especially withdrawing after having rammed, so that they wouldn't remain uh, grappled into the fight, so that, uh, to avoid that, uh, 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 yeah, that uh, Antony's uh, troops would, would also board them, which would still happen anyway, but still trying to avoid that as much as possible. Um, so, think even about, you know, getting closer to to firepower sources, firepower, especially if the enemy ships are more concentrated, so that there's a heavy one. Um, they they tended Octavian tended, as we've seen, to avoid properly hand-to-hand combat, and they they managed to to inflict heavy losses with this back and forth carried out as better as as, as well as they could. And eventually, you know, the battle would be settled uh, with this broader collective order being shattered and eventually the single pockets overwhelmed, right? And uh, in a way, um, Octavian's um, ship handling satyrs and the rowers endured most of the airships and fatigues, while on Antony's side it was mostly the marines who bore the brunt of the fighting, either being targeted or ass- assaulting proper tr- or trying that, which just think about the adrenaline and all that, you know, what it means to, to board or even just to set your mind on boarding. And it's exhausting just f- for thinking if and if it wasn't just for, from an athletic point of view doing that. So you think of a completely different physicality from our own and in generally speaking from even what kind of modern soldiers uh, are used to fight like. Um, so as always, these major battles way way more leveled, usually than than they uh, than did the, the odds were much more balanced than we we think, and it went on like this. It wasn't a tri- you know it were mostly attrition battles, in some ways, and we know of the horrors of these fights. Uh, people burned uh, alive. Uh, uh, Think about just the the oars. People just obviously drowned, um, drowned um, without getting out of, of the galleys. Um, the galleys mashing against each other. You know, think about just the noise, right? The the trumpets, the screams, uh, the the no, you know the the mass of people fighting on the decks, right? So um, even just think about the water. You know, all human bodies floating, wreckage. Um, Satyrs trying to swim uh, for well, to finding some, you know, to be connected to, to their ships or to some uh, wreck they could stay on. And 
uh, of course the heavier marines uh, drowning because of of their heavy gear and we have the savage flight actually well well described by Dio and let's read it uh, as a matter of fact in conclusion Caesar men um, Caesar's so is talking about Octave damaged the lower parts of the ships uh, all around, crashed the oars, snapped off the rudders, the rudders, excuse me, and climbing on the decks seized hold of some of the foe and pulled them down, pushed off others, and fought with yet others since they were now equal to the to them in numbers. Some, and particularly the sailors, perished by the smoke before the flame so much as approached them, while others were roasted in the midst of it as though in ovens. Just think about this. Others were consumed in their armor when it became heated. There were still others who, before they should suffer such a death, or when they were of burned, threw off their armor and were wounded by shots from a distance, or again leaped into the sea and were drowned, or were struck by their opponents and sank, or were mangled by sea monsters. Yeah, you know, because they believed in this objectively. And um, they were extremely superstitious, but, you know, they surely were sea monsters. We have to credit that. Uh, the only ones to find a tolerable death, considering the sufferings which prevailed, were those killed by their fellows in return for the same service, or else who killed themselves before any such fate could befall them. These had no tortures to endure. And when they were dead, they had the burning ships for their funeral pyres. When a ship caught fire under any circumstances, the men first used first the drinking water butts to try to extinguish the flames, and if it, this, this failed, they tried to use sea water. But this was not practical in the chaos of a battle. It was even claimed that the salt water actually made the flames burn more vigorously. Then, as Cassius uh, the wrote, when they found themselves getting the worst of it in this respect, also they heaped on the blaze their thick mantles and the corpses and the corpses but later here's um, skip the text where it says when the wind raged furiously the flames flared up more than than ever fed by this very fuel all right so this is savage enough and tells something about what the you know uh, the, in fact here it's very dramatic but it's objectively spot on um, about the, the the early Roman, uh, you know, the early imperial um, Roman marine experience could be like, and something objectively devastating, not less than, possibly even more than the ones on uh, the, the battles on from the one the experience on on land. But as we are saying throughout all the video at this point, we will make a video specifically on this. This was it was just a video to explain more or less who these marines were, how they were equipped, what they you know they 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 fought like they they also what their perspectives were. Banally speaking, because in early medieval times, as we were saying, uh, excuse me, in early Roman uh, imperial times, this is probably one of the most pacific time uh, ever in Roman. You'll have to look at some statistic about the mortality of a Roman legionnaire at this point. Quite low, objectively. Um, but anyhow, uh, we will do it hopefully at some point. For now, I we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now... I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time.